Good morning, Zion Church, and welcome to this time of worship. It is wonderful to be with you here today on this, the first Sunday in March. We are well within our Lenten journey, but by the end of this month, it will be Palm Sunday when we will be greeting um, Jesus with hosannas and words of praise. And in the beginning of April, it will, of course, be Easter Sunday. So we have much to do in the coming weeks as we continue to look at ways to repair our relationships with one another and with God for such a time as this. Today, our theme is protest. So looking at our scriptures with new eyes, new ears, and a new heart. This month is also Women's History Month. And so I hope that in the coming weeks, you'll look at the women in your lives, the women who have come before us, and the women who are growing right before us, who will be changing history before our eyes and thinking of the way their stories are changing our world. And I hope that during our time of fellowship, maybe we can take some time to share some of those stories. Don't forget, every Sunday at 1230 and every Thursday at 530, we gather together at Zoom for a time to just get together, reacquaint one another with our stories and have a time to be together. But let us now continue with this time of worship because it is a beautiful day and this is the day that God has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.
Please join me in our call to community. The heavens are telling the glory of God. May our worship reflect God's glory. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. May we see each other as the handiwork of God. Let our prayer and praise, our singing and proclamation, project the love of God. We commune with Christians around the world, with Christians throughout time. With Christians across geography and across time. Let us worship. And let us pray. Loving God, we come to you in worship and thanksgiving. You are greater than we can understand. Open our eyes that we may see the wonderful truths you have shown to us in Jesus. You are more loving than our hearts can respond to. Help us to give ourselves to you in worship so that we may learn what you want us to be. You are wiser than we can know. Still our minds as we worship you so that we can understand the things you are saying to us. Loving God, in Jesus you chose to come to the world in humility. You chose the path the world saw as foolish. You used what the world considered weak. We worship and adore you. Amen. Our Hebrew lesson this morning comes from Exodus chapter 20. Israel has been liberated from slavery in Egypt and has set out into the wilderness. They have encountered thirst and hunger, and God has provided sweet water and bread from heaven. They have been attacked and have been victorious, and they have finally reached Sinai. In the preceding chapter, God established a mutual covenant with Israel where, unlike in the covenants with Noah and with Abraham, Israel must follow God's commands if they are to remain God's people. Here the Israelites are given the Ten Commandments, which continually point us back to Israel's formative narratives, reminding us that we are a part of the story of God's intention for humanity that began so long ago. Then God spoke all these words, I am your Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. And here we see Jesus in an act of protest as he cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. 
He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he's raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this is the gospel of Christ. So where do we find God? Where do you look for a sign of God's presence in the world and in our lives? People look for God in all kinds of different places. Some go out into nature, seeing God's handiwork, in the flowers and in the trees. Some climb up to the top of a mountain, standing in that place where the earth touches the sky. Others come to places just like this where I am today, seeing God's light shining as a prism through stained glass. The early Israelites searched for God. They wandered through the wilderness, and they didn't know how to find God. They had lived as slaves for 200 years in a foreign land. They had forgotten those ancient promises that had been given to Abraham and Sarah, those promises we heard last week. And like Pharaoh, they had forgotten all that Joseph had done to save the people and how he had brought his people, his family into Egypt for safety. They had forgotten who God was and is and how much God loved them. They'd forgotten how to live with one another without a master to order them around to tell them what to do and when to do it. And so we hear today of how Moses climbed up to that mountaintop, to that place where the earth touches the heavens. And there... He had an experience that most people never have. There he stood face to face with God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who called all of it good. And there on top of that mountain, God gave Moses and all of the people a new covenant. Simple rules for them to follow, to show their love of God and to one another. A covenant that we now call the Ten Commandments. And in that covenantal love of God and neighbor, the people discovered God right there in their very midst. And that covenant endured. The people treasured them. They carried them safely throughout the wilderness, through their darkest times. 
And then they carried them safely through the Jordan River, keeping them dry and safe, and then carried them to the promised land. They protected the covenant in the ark that they built, and then generations later, Solomon built a temple to house them, a sanctuary, a place that was sacred, so special, a place only for them. So if you'd ask those ancient Israelites, where do you find God? The answer would have been easy. You find God in the temple. When you stand in the holy temple, you were literally standing in the presence of God. But a lot happened between the time of the wilderness and the time of Jesus. The temple was built. The commandments were protected. But then the temple was destroyed, and the commandments were destroyed with them, ground into dust in the ground. The people were sent into exile. And then the people returned. The temple was rebuilt slowly. And then they were conquered once again by a new empire. New troops marching through their land. And still the people were faced with that eternal question, where do we find God? And for people in Jesus' time, it was the same answer. Tradition held that if you were standing in the presence of God, whenever you entered into the temple. That's why it was so important to rebuild that temple in Jerusalem. And so every year, as Passover, that sacred holiday, came, the city swelled with pilgrims who came into the city to bring their sacrifices to the temple so that they could enter in and be in the presence of God to experience God's sacred presence. Everyone was expected to come to the holy city at least once in their life. Many traveled from very long distances, and so they couldn't bring their sacrifices with them. Remember, people didn't have coolers. There were no refrigerators. They didn't have cars. So many of them, over time, learned that if you went to the courtyard of the temple, they had created a marketplace a place where you could buy your sacrifice, where pilgrims could get whatever they needed to honor God and where they could exchange whatever money they brought from whatever country they came from to the right currency. There were money changers there and there were sacrifices of every kind available for purchase. Cattle, sheep, doves. And today, we hear of the day that Jesus came and entered into that marketplace. But he's not there to make a purchase. As he walks in, he's furious. Here in this place, where 
people are trying to get a glimpse of the sacred. He sees vendors and money changers taking advantage of pilgrims. He sees people profiting from their faith and their vulnerability. And he can't believe his eyes. He can't believe that this is allowed. And he reacts in a way that the disciples have never seen before. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace, he screams. And he starts overturning tables. He makes a whip and he chases them all out. The angels may sing of peace, but this is a time of holy protest. Every one of our Gospels has some version of this story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have it at the end of the Gospel, happening sometime between Palm Sunday and Easter. After Jesus rides into the city, but shortly before he is crucified. It comes at the end of his ministry, but not the version we heard today. John's version is different. The story we heard today happens right after the wedding in Cana. It happens right in the beginning of his ministry. In that marketplace, Jesus makes his first public declaration of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Jesus' ministry begins as protest. He's supporting the people of God against all those who are taking advantage of them. So when Jesus drives those marketeers out, he's ushering in his ministry. And from the very beginning, Jesus challenges the traditions and the understandings of, what, of who God is and where God can be found. As those tables are turned over, so is the way people view the world. The world is turned upside down. And Jesus begins that journey of showing us where we will find God. God is found in Jesus Christ himself. Where you find Jesus, you will always find God. In Jesus, we find a world that is right side up. John finds God when he pulls Jesus down into those murky waters of the Jordan River. And as Jesus comes up to see the Holy Spirit descend. The Samaritan woman finds God when she meets Jesus at the well and he offers her living water. Thomas finds God when he reaches out and touches Jesus' wounds. Paul finds God when he is blinded by the light. Martin Luther found God on the steps of a church in Germany. Martin Luther King found God in a vision of a mountaintop. And Mother Teresa found God in the poorest place in the world, in Calcutta. We find God in the most unexpected places, sometimes at the most unexpected times. 
Where do you find God? Where does God come to you and remind you of how loved you really are? How priceless your life is? God comes to you on a city street or in a hospital room. God comes to you in the line of a soup kitchen or in a refugee camp. God comes to Palestine or Liberia, to Vietnam, or to Hagerstown, Maryland. God enters every corner of our earth where people seek a sign of the sacred, who want to see a place where earth and heaven meet. God is found in peaceful protests that demand justice for all of God's beloved children, and God is found in the smoking rubble in the aftermath after a terrorist event. God brings comfort in war zones and sings in places of peace. We find God wherever someone needs a glimpse of the sacred, that sacred love breaking forth on us like prisms of colored lights coming out of a stained glass window. God comes to you and God comes to me when we need it the most sometimes when we least expect it. So where do we find God? We find God in the places that reflect God's greatest commandment to love God with our whole being and to love one another in the same way because it is in that love, shining and bright, that we know we will always find our God. Amen. This week, as you are making your way through your day each day, look for glimpses of God's sacred presence. And then think about ways that you can use those glimpses to glorify God. We are all called to give of ourselves. Sometimes we give financially. And of course, we are grateful for every gift because every gift helps this church to continue to run. But we also give in so many other ways. We give when we volunteer. We give when we pray. 
We give when we pick up the phone and we call someone whose name suddenly comes to mind. And so this week, let us give. Let us give from the bottom of our hearts and let us give extravagantly. And let us now bless all of the gifts that have been given. God of the wilderness, we give these offerings in gratitude. Rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith. Trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts, with open hands. We hear the echo of tables being overturned, the marching feet of those who cry out for justice and a new way. We hear the cries of those who look at the cross and all it represents as foolish and old-fashioned, but still we hope. We remember another table. We remember other cries. And still, we hope. So today, we gather around this table, and we remember. We remember the stories of hope and help we remember the calls for justice and mercy. We remember that in Jesus, God calls us to embrace life in a new way. So may the Lord of the journey be with you. And also with you. Pilgrims of God, lift up your hearts. We offer them to the one who denied himself to carry us into life forever. Sing songs of thanksgiving to the God who is faithful and keeps promises. We offer glad anthems of joy to the one who calls us by name. O oh God, out of that barrenness called chaos, you called into life all that is good and true. Your face shining in the starlight, your voice echoing in the crashing waves, your heart, your hopes, your love poured into those created in your image, showering them with peace and mercy, you began to teach them all they needed in order to live in hope and in joy with you. But setting their minds on all the desires which temptation revealed to them, they began to turn away from you, denying your dreams for them as we thought only of ourselves. You continued to speak of your promises, sending the prophets into all the barren places where we lived and worked and dreamed. But we were ashamed of the words they spoke and would not listen to the love which formed them. So you asked the one called the word to leave your side and walk before you coming to live with us. 
And so we join our voices with those from every time and in every place on earth as it is in heaven, who forever calls out your praises. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of the mountaintops. The heavens join all creation to tell of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who is foolish for our sake. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You are blessed forever. When Jesus could have stumbled over our distrust, he called us to follow him into your promises. When our rejection could have weakened his faith, he grew strong in his commitment to deny himself. When he could have remained silent, he declared your salvation to all, even to those not yet alive. When he could not have hidden his face, when he could have hidden his face in fear, he turned towards Jerusalem, going to his death and into his grave, that you might give life to all who have died to sin. And as we come to the table he has prepared, we declare that in his crucifixion and resurrection, we find that mystery we call faith. Christ died, the rock which broke sin's power. Christ was raised, death conquered by our Redeemer. Christ will return, desiring us more than anything in all creation. Here at this table, where the gifts of the bread and cup are offered to your children gathered around, pour out your spirit of healing and hope. Feed us with the food of heaven, which can make us whole once more, so we can go to serve all whom we have treated with contempt. Nourish us with the cup of life, which can change us into your faithful people, so we can go to bring healing to those disabled by our prejudices. Let us always remember that we are connected by faith, and we remember those connections whenever we join our voices in our common prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we remember... We remember how on that night of denial and betrayal, how Jesus gathered together those he loved the most for one final meal, knowing how much their lives were going to change that night. And as they laughed, and as they shared stories, and as they remembered, Jesus looked at them with love in their eyes, in his eyes. And as the meal came to an end, Jesus took that last loaf of bread. And as he, they had seen him do so many times before, he raised it above his head, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is like my body, which will be broken for you, but it is so much more, because this is the bread of life, which will nourish you every step of the way. 
whenever you eat from this loaf. Remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup of blessing. And as he poured it, he said, this is God's new covenant given to you, a covenant greater than the rainbow, greater than the law, greater than all of the words of the prophets, because this is God's covenant of eternal life. Some will say that this is like my blood shed for you, but it is so much more, because this will sustain you throughout your journey and bless you forever. Whenever you drink from this cup, remember me. And so now, as we prepare to eat from the loaf and drink from the cup, we remember. We remember a baby born who angels sang over, a young man who began his ministry making sure that those who were seeking God had an opportunity to finish their pilgrimage. We remember a man who healed and taught and with bread was able to feed thousands. And we remember that this story of this last meal has been shared for generations, nourishing and sustaining congregations just like ours all around the world, helping to grow the word, helping to share the story, helping to sustain our faith and showing what eternal life can look like. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us rejoice as we prepare to share in our feast. Thank you. 
So our time of worship is over, but our time of service has just begun. And don't forget that next Sunday, we will be starting just a little bit earlier because daylight savings time is start Saturday night. So make sure you change your clocks. Now, go forth into the world without fear, knowing that the weakness of the holy is stronger than every human power. Go in peace, my beloved. Amen. Thank you.